Patrick, the discussion around PMA seems to have largely moved on from issues of safety and legitimacy to one of competition. What strategies are OEMs using to counter the threat from PMA and how are PMA companies responding? Well, um, we talked a little bit about that earlier today. The, the OEMs have tried several different strategies over the time uh, to go and try to limit the competition, uh, including buying uh, repair stations, uh, sort of cornering the market that way. Uh, they've tried different things with uh, maintenance instructions and things like that. Um, but uh, the, the way that the PMA companies uh, deal with these things is they just continue to educate the customers in terms of uh, making sure that there are choices and that the, the customers want to have choices. Uh, and so the, the, the PMA and aftermarket providers go and provide those choices to the customers. Um, I think it's back to something that uh, Gary Copeland said earlier today of uh, when a OEM goes and tries to corner the market on something, it creates a monopoly. Uh, and the uh, customers don't necessarily want the monopoly, so they're looking for different options and different opportunities to go and find an alternative. So where do you think the balance of power now lies in the aftermarket? I think the balance of power has moved over time, uh, but right now it's moving back towards the owners and operators. Um, you know, they, um, aside from the passengers buying uh, tickets, the owners and operators have the most power because they're determining where uh, parts get made, uh, where parts are overhauled, um, what types of parts they want. So, so long as the owners and operators uh, have a choice and are willing to exercise that choice, the balance of power goes back to the owners and operators. Has the economic downturn encouraged airlines to turn to PMA parts? The economic downturn um, has encouraged the owners and operators to go and focus back on the costs. Uh, they're always trying to be cost competitive with their competitors, um, so focusing on the maintenance costs that they can control uh, lead them into, you know, how can I do a better job of ma managing my costs and can I find an, an opportunity or an option that will go and reduce my costs overall. So yes, it, it does go and tend to take the operators to look at different options and PMA and DER repairs are definitely one of those. Which geographic markets are the biggest new adopters of PMA and which regions might need further convincing about the merits of PMA? Well, the North America and Europe are the biggest adopters of PMA. Uh, PMA is a, U a U.S. thing, so therefore it's, it's definitely a U.S.-based uh, uh, phenomenon. Uh, but Europe is uh, the second one. They've uh, continuously gone and improved the uh, acceptability of PMA parts within Europe. The bilateral agreement of 2011 just uh, re-solidified that. Um, you know, any parts that are not critical are accepted without further showing. Uh, the FAA has done a great job in going and creating bilateral agreements with other regulators to go and ensure that uh, PMA parts are accepted throughout the world, uh, as well as all types of uh, FAA certified parts. So um, I think uh, we continue to educate the, uh, the customers on terms of the acceptance of PMA parts and uh, the savings that you can get from PMA parts, and there will continue to be more and more acceptance throughout the world. Have lessors changed their position on PMA over the past few years, or have airlines been able to negotiate leasing contracts which are more favorable? Sure. Um, the, the lessors um, haven't necessarily changed their positions, but I think they're doing a better job of clarifying the positions. Um, you know, they started out with a position of, no, uh, you can't use PMA or DER repair parts. Uh, but as you talk to them more and more, uh, you'll find out that that, uh, that no isn't an overarching global no. Um, it's more about uh, what types of PMA parts and in what application. Um, you know, the interior parts are widely accepted, whereas uh, LPs are not accepted. So somewhere in that continuum is an acceptance for a given uh, aircraft or an engine. Um, likewise, as there are more and more operators who are requesting PMA parts, and there's more lessors who are wanting to lease an aircraft, uh, there's more competition in the, the leasing business, so therefore the, the owners and operators are, are willing to make more of a, a point in the negotiation to say, I want to be able to use PMA parts, and the lessors are having to come to terms of how much will I allow, where will I allow it. Uh, so I think the, the market is shifting, and it's more just a, a clarification in terms of what they will and will not accept, and also the, the age of the asset. As the uh, engine or the aircraft gets older, uh, lessors may be more willing to accept PMA and DER repair parts. And lastly is what is the ultimate uh, next step for this asset? If the next asset is going to be leased one more time and then broken up, then there's a completely different dynamic in terms of the remarketability of that asset. Has there been any change in the types of components which are being developed and promoted by PMA companies? The PMA companies uh, develop a huge variety and range of parts. Um, 
we tend to get driven by our customers in terms of where they'd like us to go. Um, so as uh, the industry changes, um, if there's uh, more surplus in a, a particular uh, engine model, then we'll tend to do less PMA work there. We may go someplace where there's uh, less surplus or uh, more new usage. Um, so really it depends on what our customers are looking, where are they looking for solutions, where do they see their current problems, that tends to drive us into new developmental areas. And finally, where next for PMA and where next for HICO? Um, where next for PMA is going to be wherever the, the industry drives us, uh, sort of back to your last question. Um, you know, the, we've, we've been driven in multiple different areas. I started with Heiko. We were an engine company and then we got into um, the accessories and components. Uh, now we're doing interiors. Uh, I would say that's going to be a continuing ed evolution. Uh, we're still doing engine parts, uh, we're still doing components parts, and we're still developing new interiors parts. Uh, so it really is uh, being driven by our customers. Um, we're next for Heiko. Um, Heiko is a publicly traded company. Uh, we have uh, very aggressive uh, growth targets for the future. And I think so long as our customers continue to look to us for solutions, um, whether it's a, a reliability improvement or just uh, cost savings, whether it's tactical or strategic, I think uh, they'll continue to come to us and continue to look for us to, to grow our own portfolio to go and continue to help save that money. Patrick, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, John.